Hello, everyone, and welcome to our more or less monthly book club. My name is Massimo Pilucci. I am a faculty at the City College of New York, and my friend Jamie Lombardi uh, is the co-host for this Zoom show, so we call it, <laughs> from Bergen College. Hi, Jamie. How are you? I'm all right, Massimo. How are you doing? Good. Thank you. So um, before we actually get to today's topic, uh, let me announce the next book club, which will take uh, place on Sunday, May 16th at 1 p.m. Eastern Time. And we will be discussing The Ethics of Ambiguity by Simone de Beauvoir, one of the fund foundational texts of feminist and existential philosophy. So I'm really looking forward to that one. For that special uh, event, uh, our friend Sky Cleary, who uh, has written a thing or two about <laughs> uh, existentialism will will join us as well. So I'm looking forward to it. If you like to participate to that event on May 16th, please go register on uh, meetup.com. Look for the Philosophy Book Club. If you wish to watch past episodes of the Philosophy Book Club with Jamie and myself, then go to the Stoa Nova YouTube channel and look for the Philosophy Book Club playlist and uh, you'll find us. So today we are going to talk about Nemesis, a novel that came out in 2010 by uh, American writer uh, Philip Roth, which is set during a devastating disease outbreak in New Jersey at the onset of World War II, and which of course has ob obvious resonance with what we're going through uh, right now. Now, before we get started with the conversation, of course, spoiler alert, uh, we will give away plot points <laughs> throughout the rest of this discussion. So if you haven't read the novel, you might wanna, I don't know what you wanna do. It doesn't matter, it's not a crime novel. So, uh, you know, we won't tell you the culprit or anything like that, but there is just, it's just gonna be impossible to discuss, meaningfully discuss it without giving away some major uh, points. I hope you read the novel. If you haven't, uh, I highly recommend it. It's, it's, a, it's a really interesting uh, piece of writing. Jamie, in fact, before we get into the details of it, what, what did you think overall? What's, uh, what's, what's your general take? So I adore this book. Um, this is, <laughs> I'm so grateful um, that you had put this on the list and that we read it, um, which is not to say that it wasn't a challenging read. After reading it, I had to put it down and step away. I cried throughout reading this book, but I found it to be really powerful and the sort of novel that at least for me, um, made me rethink how I understood myself in the world. Even this was really a fantastic piece of literature in my opinion. Yeah. What about you? Yeah, I, I had a similar reaction. I mean, I, I read other uh, novels by Roth and always liked him, uh, but this one was certainly uh, incredible for a variety of reasons, well, obviously, because it resonates with things that we're going on through today, but also because there were so many interesting references, uh, you know, and points of discussion in terms of from a philosophical perspective about, uh, you know, the main character and how he's wrestling with the, with the ongoing, um, with the unfolding situation. Uh, it's, uh, it, yeah, it's, and, and we should say the novel is divided into three broad uh, sections, titled sections. The last bit, uh, let's see, let me look at, my notes. So the, the first section is called Equatorial New Work, and it's it sets up this the scene. Basically, tells you how the 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 um, the problem, which is uh, a polio uh, spread uh, in uh, in New Jersey in 1944, it unfolds, and your know, people people become uh, sort of more or less aware of it. And there is the, the initial, you know, skepticism. And then the, the authorities, of course, try to say, well, eh, it's not a big deal. You know, let's not shut everything down. And then, of course, there's panic, there's blaming and all sorts of things, good things that we're going to get to, I think, eventually. Uh, the second part is called Indian Hill because the major character, whose name is Buck Cantor, uh, Buck is a young, uh, just graduated uh, physical education instructor. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background, he is um, he grew up with his grandparents because his father is a deadbeat, basically, in being in prison and stuff like that. And his mother died uh, early on. So, and his grandfather was a fairly stern person and tried to instill in in Bucky a uh, sort of sense of honor and virtue and you know behaving appropriately and not not from a formal perspective of you know seriously proper properly uh, you know taking care of things and uh, you know not being a coward and all that sort of stuff and then however uh, Bucky cannot join his 
friends who almost all of them left for the war because he has uh, you know this this serious uh, high eyesight problem so he, he cannot he's disqualified so he graduates from college he gets this job uh, during the summer as a, essentially a supervisor of playgrounds in New York and and his the children that go there uh, love him and you know he's, he's a great guy and um, he's also very you know, he, he defends them against sort of intruders. Uh, there is one scene in which a group of Italians from another neighborhood come in just to cause trouble, and he stands up to the all, all 11 of them successfully. So he is this, that kind of character. However, of course, the polio is beginning to strike, and the children are going to start dying, including several that he knew personally. And his fiance, who has retreated in the Poconos Mountains in a, in a campground with four kids also, finds him a job. Uh, to move there out of the of danger to join her uh, you know have a great rest of the summer and he's as we'll discuss with Jamie Bucky is very is wrestling with this situation should I abandon my commitment to stay in Newark should I do it should I not uh, in the end he decides to do it that's the second part of the book called Indian Hill because that's the name of the of uh, the retreat uh, the campground where he goes and and um, uh, and work and everything seems to be fine there except that again as we'll discuss Bucky is tormented by guilt for having left new work and he's not he's not doesn't seem to be able to enjoy uh, the situation and then polio strikes there as well and in fact eventually gets him as well so then the the, the, the story moves forward several years you know decades in fact um, and the third part of the story uh, which is entitled Reunion, is uh, essentially one scene, well, two, two major scenes, but it's, it's uh, uh, told from the point of view of Arnie Mesnikov, who is actually the narrator of the, of the, the book. And Arnie was actually one of Bucky's students, you know, the, the, the kids that were on the playground. He got hit by polio as well. He, like Bucky, survived it, but they're... they're life trajectories went into completely different directions. And so there's this really heart-wrenching conversation between, um, you know, the former kid and, and the instructor, which also gives us a, uh, a back, back, looking, uh, back look at these also heart-wrenching conversation between Baki and his uh, fiancé when, when he was in the hospital. So that's pretty much the outline of what's going on. Where do we start? Because there's so much. <laughs> so, I don't, I th think we have to start with moral luck. That seems sure. to me central to the story. And there was one line that stood out to me in particular, and it I, is one of the reasons I'm so glad we're doing Simone de Beauvoir at next time. But in, in the novel, he says, sometimes you're lucky and sometimes you're not. Any biography is chance and beginning at conception, chance, the tyranny of contingency is everything. Yeah. And I just found that to be so powerful because that is at the heart of the story, whether or not you get to grow up with your parents, whether or not there's somebody to be there for you to, to sort of serve as a band-aid in the aftermath of tragedy, whether or not you meet someone, whether or not you decide to take that leap, take that risk. And the narrative you tell yourself about how this moral luck unfolds and its implication for the quality of the life you live, I, I don't know where else to start. <laughs> that's right. No, so let's talk about moral luck, right? Um, that's, that is a great point. And in particular, I think one of the things that struck me as interesting is, of course, that uh, uh, Bucky realizes that a lot of these things, he, he actually explicitly talks about the fact that, you know, I, it could have easily been gone this way or that way. It could have easily happened this way or that way. So he's aware of this notion of that we would today, modern philosophers would call moral, moral luck. Uh, but part of his struggle is that he doesn't know how, if he made the right decision given the circumstances, right? And so, so he's presented with a certain number of, of choices and options. And at some point, it makes one decision or another, and then he's constantly regretting it. Uh, and he's constantly thinking, well, maybe I should have gone the other way. He wants to do the right thing. That's, that's what he gets from, from his grandfather, right? He's, he's got this very strong sense of 
duty in a very strong sense of I have to do the right thing, but luck gets in the way, and and uh, and so this serendipity gets uh, gets in the way. Um, part of the thing that interests me uh, really is well, we should talk more about the concept of moral luck probably, but also this interaction between luck and um, and your choices, right, or how your choices are constrained by by what actually happens to you um, and and how and that that the measure of who you are basically as a person is precisely it's not it's not how you control the events because you can't control the events it is how you react to the events that happen to you right so you want to talk a little bit more about moral luck because that's as you say that's a crucial point and i'm trying to find a quote that i want to bring up in the this in this particular bit of the discussion yeah so um so again, spoiler, if you haven't read the book. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so one of the, the biggest turning points in the novel is, is toward the end after he's gone to Indian Hill and he's, he's there and he's with his fiance and he's, he's making love in the woods. And by all accounts, this should be, you know, a life affirming, wonderful experience. Right. And, you know, he's tormented as you pointed out because he lives with this overpowering sense of duty. And then, tragedy strikes in the camp and someone that he was helping to learn to dive and practice their dives is stricken with polio. And there's this mad dash. He's also brought to the hospital. He's tested for polio. And it turns out that he also has polio. And it's left sort of open and ambiguous whether or not he brought the polio there, whether right. or not it happened independently. And I think this is really where the novel gets its name from. Bucky passes judgment on himself. He deems himself guilty and he deems himself deserving of eternal punishment to the extent he can inflict it on himself because the story that he tells himself is not just that he brought polio to the camp, but that he brought polio to the camp because he had abandoned his duties and everything is his fault and everything turns on his choice when in reality, you don't, you don't know. Um, and as far as a quote, I think Marsha captures it best when she says to him in the hospital, you could never put things at the right distance, never. You're always holding yourself accountable when you're not. Either it's terrible God who is accountable or it's terrible Bucky Cantor who is accountable when in fact, accountability belongs to neither. Like sometimes that's right. just how the dice fall. That's right. Shit just happens. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, so Marsha, of course, is uh, is his fiance. The bit that I, that I found that is uh, that I found in interesting, the quote that I want to read in, in, in a second here, uh, uh, is found right at the end of the first section. So this is before B Bucky has, has agreed now to move to Indian Hill and join his fiance. And, uh, uh, and he has to tell his boss, right? Uh, he has to tell this guy, Ogara, who has given him the, the job during the summer, you know, fresh out of college. And of course, Ogara is not happy that he, that he is leaving. And at some point, uh, you know, Bucky retreats onto a common, you know, explanation or excuse, however you want to put it. That is, you know, I have no choice. I have to, I have to go, right? And o Ogara says, what? You have no choice, do you? Sure, you got a choice. What you're doing is called making a choice. You're making your escape from the polio. You sign up for a job, and then there is the polio, and the hell with the job, the hell with the commitment. You run like hell as fast as you can. All you're doing is running away. Cancer or world champion muscle man like you. That's it. So right. he's making a choice. And it's this notion that, oh, well, I have no choice because you know, it's kind of forced on me. It's actually not true. And of course, Bucky realizes that. That's why he's, he's, you know, his conscience is he impresses with, with his conscience. But this notion, uh, this response, we all, it's something that we often bring up when we think the circumstances leave us no choice. Well, I had no choice. Of course, I have to go away from the polio. Of course, I have to join, uh, you know, my fiance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, uh, certain philosophies of life. Let's pick one at random: Stoicism. Uh, will tell you that you always have a choice. Uh, sometimes the choices are, you know, bad versus really, really, really bad. <laughs> um, but you do have a choice, right? So when uh, Epictetus, the Stoic philosopher, says that our ultimate freedom re relies, it rests on 
our capacity for judgment, our capacity for choices. We are making a choice. Bucky is not actually forced to leave Newark. He's making a choice. And uh, it's, it's a, I think, you know, one can argue it's a very reasonable choice. Uh, he can't do anything there in Newark. It's not like he can stop the polio uh, from spreading. Uh, in fact, st- soon after he, uh, he leaves, the city shuts down the campground, the, the, the playgrounds. So he would have been out of a job anyway in a couple of weeks. Of course, he doesn't know at the moment where he's making the, cho- the choice. But there's nothing really he can do there. The only reason to stay is just because he made the commitment, just because he said, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay. And that's a, you know, that can be arguably a good reason to stay, but it's not, a partic- you know, it's not a compelling reason necessarily. But the thing is, you are, in fact, making a choice. You are living. And it is this wrestling of, with, with the choices that he makes that, that uh, uh, really characterize most of the novel. He just cannot get over the fact that he should have done otherwise, he could have done otherwise. He, uh, he keeps d- second guessing himself uh, over and over and over. And then as you say, punishing himself uh, over and over. Yeah, it really stood out to me the way that inheritance is so much more than just the material things we're left with. After the people we love pass away, his, his grandfather's sense of the world and his sense of duty is passed down as much to him as anything else. And Bucky can't seem to shake himself from that understanding. And it's it's so baked in. He's he's not only not aware of it, he's fundamentally incapable of permitting himself any sort of happiness. There's he doesn't take the time to consider that, you know, being 23 and recently graduated from college is, you know, a good enough reason to go to the Poconos in the summer and, and get out of a hot spot of polio. Like that seems legitimate, but there's no possibility in his moral landscape for that. He's just sort of propelled forward by like the inertia of of the moral system that had been bequeathed to him without any consideration, whether he should adopt it or it's good or he's living up to his values. And in fact, the person that he gets this moral system from his grandfather actually died a couple of years earlier. And so he can no longer be uh, Bucky's soundboard, right? So it's very possible that his grandfather would have, might have been the first one to say, yeah, of course, get the hell out of here, because what are you risking your life for? Uh, this is a misguided way of applying you know, the notion of, of, of duty. But, but his grandfather is not around anymore, and he doesn't have any similar figure. The only figure that comes close to that is his fiancé's father, who is a doctor and who has to stay in the city because he's a doctor. <laughs> uh, but um, uh, but they're not, their relationship is not to the point where Bucky can feel comfortable going there and asking for advice, uh, essentially. And, and so he has to make a decision on his own. And so you can imagine uh, this 23-year-old who is already, already feels, so he has been brought up by a grandfather who is trying to you know, instill in him this very strong sense of duty and apparently succeeded. He's already feeling guilty for no good reason about not being in the war. I mean, it's not his fault. He's, he's just, he, he couldn't shoot you know, at two, two meters away because of his eyesight. So it's obviously good, a good thing that he's not in the war, but he feels guilty that everybody else is, is gone. And now he sees like this, is, this was his chance to actually do something and make a, a, moral, a moral stand. And he, and he decides not to do it as, either. Yeah, it really, I think, challenges this, this notion of masculinity as well. Like he can't conceive of yeah. himself as, as doing something, you know, sufficiently deserving of respect because he's not off picking up guns and engaged in fights. Like he can't conceive of caring for children or, or going to the summer camp to be with his girlfriend as equal in value as shooting Nazis, which is not to say that it's not important to sh- you know, to punch Nazis when there are Nazis. Um, <laughs> but that's not the only way to, to have value or to, to contribute. And he can't seem to, to get that at all. Yeah, one of our uh, viewers, Barbara, is actually pointing out correctly that Bucky has yet another fear. He's afraid of being like his father. Right? So he has these two role models one positive, his grandfather, and one negative, his his father, who was you know that beat and uh, uh, and never took care of him and so on and so forth, and renegated on his on his 
promises. So, so there is this, this contrast between these two strong figures in, in his life um, that, that, you know, contribute to tr uh, tear him apart. Uh, back to the issue of Mona Lack for a minute, uh, there is a, there is a couple, there are a couple of quotes uh, in the, the second part, Indian Hill. So, so when Bucky is already uh, on the, you know, outside of, outside of Newark and where he reflects on the role of fate and God in a, in a sense. Uh, and then, and then he has this really uh, strong argument with, with his uh, girlfriend, right? So I'm going to read just a little bit of it. Um, he says he was the narrator says he was struck by how lives diverge and by how powerless each of us is up is up against the force of circumstance. And where does God figure in this? Why does he set on one person down in Nazi occupied Europe with a rifle in his hands and the other in the Indian Hill dining lodge in front of a plate of macaroni and cheese? Right? <laughs> so um, so this is the this contrast between luck or fate or whatever it is and the alleged God, role of God. Then he has this discussion with his girlfriend where he says, but how can a Jew pray to a God who has put a curse like this on a neighborhood of thousands and thousands of Jews? And uh, uh, the, the fiancé responds, I don't know what exactly you're driving at. Uh, he was suddenly afraid to tell her, afraid that if he persisted in pressing her to understand what he did, he would lose her and the family with her. They had never before argued or clashed of, over anything. Never once had, had he sensed in his loving Marsha a speck of opposition, a speck of opposition, or she in him, for that matter. And so, just in time, before he began to ruin things, Bucky reined himself in, at least for now. The, the moral of that bit of that scene is never argue metaphysics with your loved ones, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's usually a bad idea. <laughs> it's true. Uh, back when I was still in grad school, I once told someone that I was dating that I didn't believe in marriage anymore because I didn't know that it would be fair to my future persons because I there had been go. taking a seminar with Derek Parfit at the time. And it's just not an appropriate way to talk to a romantic <laughs> <No>. interest. <laughs> um, you just should not do that. I learned. <laughs> But on the other hand, it is an important conversation to have, certainly with yourself, as Buck was, was having, Bucky was having, but also, I, you would think, with people who matter in your life. I mean, it's, it is a, it's a conundrum. It's, it's a situation. Maybe it's, it's a question of how you present your ideas and under what circumstances, you know, and what, on what occasion. Uh, but it is something that uh, I can see somebody struggling with, as, as in, you know, if I have a strong sort of opinion about either ethics or metaphysics or whatever it is, then I ought to be able to share it with the people that I care for and that allegedly care for me. But, but in this particular exchange, of course, uh, you know, he goes, he goes pretty strong on, on, on Marsha and then, and then uh, finally he stops at the last, at the last minute. So he holds on, uh, on to things, but, but eventually he does have th had these really heart wrenching conversation with Marsha uh, later on when he's in the hospital recovering, right? Uh, should we talk about that for a minute? Yeah. So, um, so what happens, this is told in the third uh, and last section of the book. Uh, and let me see if I find the um, exact quote. At some point, uh, he says, uh, so, so Marsh is, is going to the hospital when he's recovering, where Bucky's recovering. And Basically, she says, you know, I just, I, I want to be with you and uh, I want to, I still want to marry you and I want to, you know, spend the rest of my life with, with you. And uh, his response is, no, you don't. Uh, you, I'm a cripple and I'm going to be affected by this for the rest of my life. And you really don't owe me anything. You're just, uh, you know, you're just trying to be nice, basically. Um, but, but, you know, it's like, I actually know better than you do what's good for you, which is essentially the underlying message. So let me read you a couple of things and then we'll talk about this. I know you better than you or what, what, what people actually owe other people in this, these circumstances. Um, says, I hold her a freedom. He's now explaining to his former uh, student. I hold her a freedom, he finally said, and I gave it to her. I didn't want the girl to feel stuck with me. I didn't want to ruin her life. She hadn't fallen in love with a cripple and she shouldn't be stuck with one right um look he said this is during the dialogue with marcia this is what i look like she did not speak but she did not blink either 
No, he told her, he was no longer man enough to be a husband and a father, and it was irresponsible of her to think otherwise. Irresponsible of me, she cried, to be the noble heroine. Yes. What are you talking about? I'm not trying to be anything other than the person who loves you and wants to marry you and be your wife. Right. So, so this is, and the exchange go on and it's like, it's really hard, actually. It's, it's a really heart wrenching uh, exchange, but so what, what's your, what's your take on, on that particular bit, which is a crucial part of the, of the last part of the novel. That is who is being the fool there? I mean, is, is she being the, you know, romantic heroine because she doesn't really understand what's going on and what, what kind of life she's looking forward. Um, or is he being the condescending man who says, you know, I'm actually, uh, I know better than you do. Don't be silly or both or neither. I mean, I both and neither. Um, <laughs> Good, excellent. <laughs> that covers everything. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm, I can already feel the tears in um, my eyeballs. Um, this scene, I, I wept through. For those who don't know, um, I, I lost a husband seven years ago after a very serious illness. Um, and so there's, I can say with certainty, Marcia has no idea what she's signing up for, you know, in being a caretaker to someone who is seriously ill. And I can also say with conviction that Bucky is utterly ridiculous to think that love goes away and you stop caring for a person because they change. Um, or they need a different style of care. And I think this is one of the ways that we don't address enough how ableism perpetuates our thinking and our relation to the world and other people, because all of us at some point are going to grow old and need care, even if we otherwise live really healthy lives. But we're so fearful of this. We're so afraid of being dependent on others in other ways that we alienate ourselves it was just, I'm sorry, I'm getting choked up. Um, <laughs> no, it's, un it's un understandably, yeah. Absolutely. Um, uh, yeah, that, you know, he, he can't conceptualize that he could still be deserving of love after he's changed in this way. And that, to me, just broke my heart and reminded me of the beginning of the story about how the absence of his parents was so defining for him that, he's just not able to really embrace this idea that he's, he's loved and he's, you know, part of a family where he belongs. And that seems to really come up at the end in very like gravity's rainbow sort of way. It's tragic. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's, it, I thought it was interesting that one of the phrases that Bucky uses is like, you didn't sign up for this. Right. So that is a common phrase, but it, the, the kind of the implication there, it seems to me is like, this is a contract. And, you know, you sign up for this and then now the, the other party is switching things over uh, uh, on you. And so you're perfectly, you should be, you should be abandoning the country, you should leave in the country. But the relationship between people are not like that. They're not contracts. It's not, you're not buying a house uh, that somebody says has certain characteristics and it turns out it doesn't. And then you say, well, you know, that's not what I signed up for. I don't want to do these kind of things. So I'm, I'm buying out. It's it is this contractual view of relationship between people, which I think is, is reductive. I mean, as you, as you were saying a minute ago, absolutely the woman here doesn't know what she's signing up for, but it is her choice to sign up for it. And if anything, it is her choice in the future to say, you know what, I thought I could take it, but I can't. The, you know, it's like, yeah, that's a possibility. That is something you can, you can uh, in all good heart, say, look, I am going to stick with you. And then, you know, five years later or 10 years later, whatever it is, realize that, you know what, I'm sorry, I, it, this, this is just beyond me. It's beyond my capacities. And, you know, that, that is an option. That is a possibility, but it has to come from her. You can't be, I think, imposed by him other, because if you do that, then it becomes condescending, uh, I think. Yeah, I agree. It, it also struck me how much of this was motivated by his desire to hold on to something like nobility, to feel right. as though he had, you know, some strength of character that warranted the same kind of respect that his friends deserved after having gone off to fight the Nazis. And so he constructs this narrative in which he's doing something really upstanding and noble. But what he's really doing is condescending because it should be 
her choice. Yes, yeah, she might decide after having to actually care for him for however long that it's too much and she doesn't want to do it. But he denies her the ability to even make that choice. And it's heart wrenching at the end when he's telling the story to, to Alan about how he doesn't even want to know about her. He hopes she's married with children and lived happily ever after, but he can't even bear to hear it. And yeah, it's just, right. oh, you just kind of want to reach in and like shake them. Like, yes, that is the feeling I had several times during the novel. It's like, <laughs> come on, dude, what, what are you doing here? Uh, Alfred in the chat is saying uh, something, I think, uh, right on target. Uh, he's asking, you know, is that box hubris? It does not allow or blocks uh, our choice. Yeah, that is a type of hubris. It's a type of, I know better than, uh, than the person who's actually willing to make the sacrifice or who's actually, you know, trying to make the, make the decision around. It is a, it is a kind of, um, of, of hubris. Uh, and Stephen points out that there is a key phrase that, that struck him. Uh, there is nobody less salvageable than a ruined good boy. Yeah, that's, that's one of the conclusions at the end uh, of, uh, of his students, right? There's, there's nobody that is more uh, less salvageable than a ruined good boy, which is how Bucky really saw himself pretty much from the beginning, right? He, he saw himself as damaged uh, from the beginning, despite that. Uh... Now, I want to just, just to, uh, to reiterate what we've been discussing over the last few minutes, I want to read a couple more bits from that conversation between Bucky and Marsha. Uh, at some point, he says, um, she says, stop this, please. I've seen your arm and I don't care. And he says, then look at my leg, uh, pulling up his pajama bottoms. Stop, I beg you. I think it's your body that's deformed, but the, what's truly deformed is your mind. Right? So that's an interesting observation on Marshall's part. It's like, yeah, I get it. You got these issues because you're physically, you, you've got a physical illness. But really, what is more fundamentally flawed here is your mind, is your ability to think and, and make decisions. That is what's being what, what's really flawed, what's really deformed. And, and so I go back to what I was saying earlier um, from, uh, from Epictetus, where he says, your body is what it is. It's, it is technically for the Stoics, that's an, out, uh, uh, an external, meaning it's not something you control. And if you're hit by something like polio, you realize that it definitely is something you don't control, meaning that, sure, you can take care of things as much as you can, but you know, if this is strikes, it strikes. And, and uh, you have that point, you, you have no control over the outcome. That's why the emphasis is on, on your mind, on your, you know, on, your, on your ability to make decisions, on your, um, uh, what the Stoics call prohiresis, literally the, the faculty of judgment or the ruling faculty, as Marcus Rilus puts it. By the way, let me open, a, if you don't mind, a parenthesis for a minute before uh, and then I want to hear what your what your next point is to bring to bring up. But since I've been mentioning the Stoics a couple of times, one of my own role models uh, was Larry Baker. Uh, Larry was a, um, a philosopher who died a couple of years ago at this point, and he's the author of, uh, in my mind, the most important modern book on Stoicism, which is called A New Stoicism. Um, and it's a book that I actually wouldn't necessarily recommend to the faint of heart because it's it it requires a significant amount of philosophical background to get through, but it is a fundamental contribution to modern Stoicism because it's a complete reimagination of the Stoic system for modern uh, audiences. Now, why the hell am I telling you that? Because Larry was struck by polio just about at the time that this novel is set. Uh, so right before the vaccine, a few years, because all of this, by the way, happened just before, a few years before the vaccine was introduced, just about 10 years after the events of the novel, uh, the vaccine was introduced. And, and Larry was, was struck by polio. And as a result, you know, he, he had to spend a year in an iron lung. And, uh, and then he quick, you know, it, it slowly recovered and a lot of physiotherapy and all that sort of stuff. But then the, this situation in the novel actually gets into this you, you recover at some point, but then, then with age, uh, the, there are long-term consequences of the disease. So you start again losing uh, the ability to use uh, either your limbs or your or your arms and so on. And that's what happened gradually to uh, Larry. And 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 at some point, uh, he, he he's given a talk um, that is available on on video to the uh, polio association about what it, about how he actually dealt with this situation and he said you know 
um, when I realized that I had starting having, having difficulty getting out of my office on campus and getting back home, I was like afraid of even getting up from my chair and, and having to negotiate what for everybody else was a, a you know, piece of cake. So he said, I went to see a doctor and, uh, and, uh, and the doctor and, you know, he said, uh, uh, this, this doctor was, was, a, was blind. And the doctor said, uh, you know, it is, your, your situation is what it is, but it is, a lot of it depends on how you deal with it and what kind of choices you make to deal with it. He said, look at me, for instance, I am blind. I grew up in New York City. And as you can see, I don't uh, practice in New York. I moved to a smaller town. You know why? Because negotiating the subway when you're blind is not exactly the easiest thing, <laughs> and it's not exactly the non, you know, non-anxiety uh, provoking thing. So I made a decision and I move out. And so he tells Larry, so, so have you considered asking university to put a ramp out of your office? This was in a time where it wasn't that obvious that universities would put ramp out uh, to help people on a, in a wheelchair. And he said, oh, no, I hadn't thought about that. But he did. And the university agreed. And, and that was a lesson for Larry. From that point on, he said, you know, what I have is, in, is certainly an inconvenience, as he put it. <laughs> um, for instance, uh, later on in his life, when I, when I met him, uh, you know, he was on a, he had to be on a respirator at night because um, one of the, the constant long-term consequences was that he had no control over some of his muscles. So he would stop breathing if he fell asleep. And when he told me that, I kind of like, my eyes went like this, like, what do you mean? You, <laughs> you, you, you stop breathing when you go to sleep. And he says, yeah, it's, it's an inconvenience, but you know, that's why I have this thing. And, um, you know, he, he was legendary among his students because he had not stopped teaching and he had learned to grade his students' papers with his foot because he couldn't use his arms. And of course, this was before voice recognition software on computers. Then when, when that came on, he was happy as, a, you, know, as you can imagine because now then he used the face recognition. So the reason I'm telling you this story is because it's a real life story that looks not like Bucky's, but more like his, his student, uh, more like the, the um, uh, Arnie, who actually who talks to Bucky at the at the end of the book, Arnie has made different decisions. He has made the decision to live with the disease. Okay, this thing has happened. I have to somehow do something something about it and continue our life. And so he has a job. He's he's married and so on and so on and so forth. So again, the external circumstance is not under these people's control, but how, what they do with that circumstance is under their control. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so I want to go back to hubris, but before I do, it just reminded me of this line from from Proust, which is that we don't see the world as it is. We see the world as we are. And I think very often we're not aware of how much of our interpretation of the world we're imposing on it, um, which I think is connected to this notion of of hubris. and since right. you talked about the Stoics, I'll talk about my love, Albert Camus. Yeah, um, fair enough. <laughs> yeah, um, so it, it was on my mind a lot while reading this um, because towards the end of his life, as he's writing in the last set of journals that are to be published, he sketches out what's supposed to be um, or what he hopes will be his next cycle of work, um, which is on nemesis and love to follow his cycle on judgment and exile. And it's his way of trying to explore the way that, or or the dangers of using morality to sort of impose an order or a meaning into a world that is otherwise absurd and born of chaos. And the ways that, like I said early in the novel, we want to, to pin something down to be responsible for everything that's horrible or terrifying so that we can not have to deal with what's horrifying and terrifying. And we make up these stories. And as a result, when we buy into them as thoroughly as Bucky did, we see he's he's tortured and and he's doing it to himself. When there's another interpretation of these events that could have permitted him to live a life like his students that was still full of love. And I just, I thought it was so interesting because for those who don't know, Nemesis is the ancient Greek god of of retribution and justice and the sin that most offended her was hubris and it was this really interesting context because Bucky to me doesn't exude hubris in the way that you normally 
think of it. You know, he's not spiting the gods. He isn't flying too close to the sun. He just takes himself too seriously. Like he just thinks he's, he's Atlas or something. Yeah. Well, to some extent, yeah, you're absolutely right. I think that's, that's, that's correct. Um, although there is a little bit of spiting the gods here, right? There, there are several bits in the novels where he just goes on and on and on about, about God. But I think you're right. He takes himself too seriously. Um, uh, in fact, uh, Stephen just pointed out in the chat, you know, I think his hubris is that he's a moral extremist. Yeah, he's rigid. He's, he's like, he sees only one way of doing things, and then he can't bring himself to do thing, the, the thing necessary that he thinks is right, and then he's guilty. He feels guilty about it, and um, so he, he goes into these circles of, of setting up such a high bar for himself that then, of course, he's going to fail, uh, very or at least very likely he's going to fail. And then he feels guilty, which means that then he has to set up an even higher bar for himself, which he's going to fail uh, in turn. And the result is a ruined life, um, which is a very marked contrast with, with that of his student. Uh, it, you know, in modern terms, uh, one might say this is a difference between uh, what in sort of rational emotive behavioral therapy they call catastrophizing on the one hand, as opposed to accepting a challenge on the other hand so something happens to you something that is admittedly let's shall we say problematic like what happens to Bucky um, well you can choose to see it as a catastrophe and therefore sort of wallow into this negativity that then is going to affect your entire life or you can see it as a challenge and say well okay so given this I there are certain things that I'm not going to be able to do but but maybe I should focus on the kind of things that I can do and still try to have a, a, as good a life as possible, given the circumstances that fate uh, has, has thrown my way. And that's, that goes back to a comment that you made a, a minute ago, I think, uh, to the effect that a lot of people seem to, uh, to, to have uh, um, not, not exactly clear in mind the distinction between facts as they are in the world and value judgments. Uh, we often talk about, you know, this, this is obviously a bad thing or this is obviously a good thing, forgetting that good and bad are actually human value judgments. They're not attached to things in themselves. Facts are facts. You know, stuff happens. Uh, and then whether it's good or bad and how we decide uh, to react to it, that is a value judgment. That's not to say, uh, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting, you know, sort of entirely relativistic things like, well, you know, uh, it doesn't matter what happens to you, you should be happy no matter what. That's not what I'm saying. But, but remembering that whenever we make a value judgment, whenever we attach a label, uh, you know, as good or bad or awful or, or, uh, or catastrophe, et cetera, et cetera, to something, that is actually not inherent into the thing itself. The thing itself is a, it's a thing. It's an objective fact about the world. Um, and to come up with, let's say, uh, an obvious example that is a little bit less dramatic than the ones that we were discussing, you know, winning the lottery. Lots of people s seem to be taking for granted that winning the lottery is, of course, a good thing. But as it turns out, there is pretty good research that shows that a lot of people's lives are ruined by winning the lottery, or at least they're not improved by winning the lottery. Some people's lives are, for sure, but it all depends on how you manage things. Uh, and by things, I don't just mean the money that comes into your way, but also your relations with people that are going to obviously change now that you have all that money, et cetera, et cetera. So even something so straightforward as I won the lottery, of course, I'm happy because this is a good thing. Well, is it? It's, it's a good thing if you handle it in a certain way. It could be a catastrophe if you handle it, if you don't handle it properly, if you don't handle it in you know, the right way. Yeah, so I'm actually, I dropped a link into the chat of um, a paper on this that um, I think is excellent by Holly Smith on subjective rightness. And yep. it gets at this notion that when we have to make a decision, we don't have all of the epistemic information that we need. But very often when we judge the decision that we make, we have a lot more information and we sort of hold ourselves accountable to, to make the judgment when we didn't have the information as though we did. And there's this dissonance between it that affects our judgments and how we make sense of ourselves. And she uses this example of in the Twin Towers um, when you, before they had collapsed, 
um, they were told not to take the elevator, go down the stairs. And that's yeah. generally, you know, good advice when a right. building is on fire. That was subjectively the right thing to do. Of course, we now know it wasn't. Um, they ran out of time. The elevator would have been faster. More lives would have been saved. But that doesn't mean that the person who told them what they had good reasons to believe was subjectively the right thing to do did something wrong by doing so. And in the aftermath of tragedy, it, it becomes very difficult. I, I myself was guilty of this, um, in fact, which is why a friend sent this paper to me um, mm -hmm. to help me sort it out, that it's when we're faced with tragedy, there's this urge to make sense of it because it's devastating and you want to protect yourself from it happening again. And the terrifying reality is that you just can't. This is just a built-in feature of the world that we're in. Stephen is asking you directly a question, I think. Uh, talking about oh. Camus, Nemesis has a lot of similarity to the plague, doesn't it? Um... Yeah. So actually, while I was reading this and he went to um, Dr. Steinberg, I was thinking about how Dr. Ryu um, was the moral center of that as well. And this notion of in times of pestilence that the best one can do is to be a healer, which is right. the big takeaway from the plague. Yeah. Yeah. So there are similarities there. I want to go back, if you don't mind, I'm going to read the, another couple of excerpts, excerpts. This is from the point of view of the commentator near the end of the book. And again, we're talking about how Bucky sees events at a, in a cosmic level, at a, you know, in terms of you know, what God is or is not doing. And um, so the commentator, the, the, the narrator says, um, was this is every man's version of Gnostic doctrine, complete with an evil demiurge, the divine as inimical to our being here? Admittedly, the evidence he could call from his experience was not negligible. Only a fiend would, could invent polio. Only a fiend could invent Horus. Horus was this, uh, this uh, you know, uh, mentally disturbed guy that goes around playground, you know, sort of spitting on people and touching people and doing everything that you shouldn't do during a pandemic. Only a fiend could invent World War II, and it all up add, add up. And the fiend wins. The, field, the fiend is omnipotent. Bucky's conception of God, as I thought I understood it, was of an omnipotent being whose nature and purpose was to be adduced not from doubtful biblical evidence, but from irrefutable historical proof gleaned to, during a lifetime passed on this planet in the middle of the 20th century. That's the first bit. And the second bit is interesting because the, the narrator says, you know, what he thinks about this from an atheist perspective. He says, uh, to my atheistic mind, proposing such a God was certainly no more ridiculous than giving credence to the deities sustaining billions of others. As for Bucky's rebellion against him, it struck me as absurd simply because there was no need for it. That the polio epidemic uh, among the children of the uh, Wikaik section and the children of Camp Indian Hill was a tragedy he could not accept. He has to convert tragedy into guilt. He has to find the necessity for what happens. This is kind of along the lines of something you were saying, I think, early on in, uh, in the show. That is, Bucky just seems to be unable to accept that shit happens. He yeah. has to find a reason for it, right? And, uh, and it's interesting, the, the atheistic commentator here is saying, look, uh, blaming an evil god for this stuff makes no more sense than praising a good God for the good stuff. It's, the, it's like it's the two sides of the same coin. There is no, nobody to be blamed. Some good stuff happens in life and then some bad stuff happens in life and there is no rhyme or reason for it. And only by picking and choosing, either focusing on the negative or focusing on the positive, you can possibly say, oh, somebody is responsible for, for this thing. As it turns out, in fact, nobody's responsible for this thing. Stuff, stuff just happens. Yeah, there's a passage um, earlier in the book where he's he's wrestling with God and he says, better by far to praise the irreplaceable generator that has sustained our existence from its beginning. Better by far to honor in prayer one's tangible daily encounter with that ubiquitous eye of gold isolated in the blue body of the sky and its imminent power to incinerate the earth than to swallow the official lie that God is good and truckle before a cold-blooded murderer of children. Better for one's dignity, for one's humanity, for one's worth altogether, not to mention for one's everyday idea of whatever the hell is going on here. <laughs> and right. I just... 
love that because that's such an excellent encapsulation of what this is. Like, this is absurd to pardon the phrase. This whole yeah. notion of existence, consciousness is ridiculous and it's rife with tragedy and suffering. But there's also the opportunity for beauty and to fall in love. And Bucky is so caught up on there being this omnipotent force on imposing responsibility onto the world that he fundamentally prevents himself from being able to enjoy all the good that exists. And it's sad. Right. We have, uh, we've got a few more minutes, but we have a uh, question in the audience. Uh, uh, Dan, uh, you can unmute yourself. No, you have not yet. Uh, hold on a second. While we're waiting, I was right curious now. what you. Sorry, you got it. Yes, thank you. Okay, great. Um, Go for it. I, I've enjoyed hearing how you describe one element of the story, is about how the character deals with fear and making decisions, having the courage to make decisions, with big topics like war, health, uh, relationships, and what occurs to me is in our studying of uh, philosophy, like at, the, at my group, Orlando Stoics, it seemed like every week we have someone who's coming to the group seeking answers to these big questions. And they're sometimes looking for an oversimplified uh, tool for like, for situation A, I can apply concept B. Uh, and I tried to explain to them that it's, that life is, has so many facets to it, that it's hard that we can provide some guidance, but you ultimately have to make the decision. And so it occurs to me today that this, your meeting today is great because it's showing how storytelling itself is a tool or could be a tool for philosophy because it's not just a verse in the Enchiridion or the meditations, it's now two or 300 pages of nuance. And so I'd like to hear your comments about storytelling yeah. as teaching philosophy. Good question, thank you. Jamie, what do you think? Well, Camus said, if you wanted to write philosophy, you should write novels. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there's the answer. So I, that, that, that said, hold on. However, there is Plato who said that the poets should be banned uh, from the Republic because they are many, they're, they're, they're capable of manipulating uh, people's emotions. And then again, this is Plato who actually wrote most of his philosophy as dialogue in dialogue forms, right? So, so using fiction. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I think that... Um, uh, storytelling is obviously very powerful and it is certainly a powerful way to do philosophy. I mean, that's why Jamie and I, uh, once every two or three episodes, we pick a, a novel, uh, you know, fiction, uh, rather than an explicit, uh, you know, philosophical uh, book, because it's certainly the case that if you read something like the next book that we, we picked, uh, you know, the, the Ethics of Ambiguity, it's since it is uh, narrative, it's, it's um, you know explicitly philosophical. Then you can definitely pack a lot into you know 200 pages or 300 pages or whatever whatever it is. So it becomes very dense, and it becomes you know it's it's certainly a way to convey a lot of information and nuance uh, from a sort of theoretical philosophical perspective. But at the same time, it might not strike you at an emotional level. Uh, in, in the way in which a novel like Camus or, or like Roth or like other things that we read or we're going to read in the future uh, are certainly capable of doing. And uh, of course, it depends on who is writing the novel <laughs> and how they're running. And so the, the, it's very difficult to write good philosophical novels or good novels that have a philosophical, a serious philosophical uh, component to it. Because obviously you have to be a good writer, <laughs> otherwise don't 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 even think about it. Uh, and but you also have to have thought more or less explicitly in philosophical terms. So some of these writers clearly have. Like there are several passages in Nemesis where Roth explicitly tells you, like the the, the big that I, the bit that I just mentioned about diagnostics. You know, he must have read uh, about that conception of God and and so on and so forth. And there's no way he just he pulled it out out of out of thin air without having thought about it uh, before. And uh, I don't know. In, in in science fiction, for instance, one of my favorite uh, authors is Philip K. Dick, and we know that he read a lot of philosophy and thought very carefully about about philosophy. So it's obvious that's why his books. Um, and stories are a favorite of philosophers in you know college level courses because they're 
there are it's obviously there and it's 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 not uh it's really no mystery that dick was thinking along philosophical lines so obviously it depends what you're picking and and who the writer is but yes absolutely it can be it can be very powerful um even bad novels can be very powerful unfortunately like ayn rand for instance <laughs> <laughs> um, the message is awful the writing is ghastly and yet look at that you know 7 million copies sold in the United States so <laughs> it's second only to the Bible uh, so, you know there you go you gotta be careful about what you ask for <laughs> uh, Jamie we got a few more minutes any, any parting thoughts about Nemesis yeah so there's one question that I wanted to ask you um, this scene in, in the novel gave me a sort of morbid chuckle. We know now that polio is passed um, from through feces as one of the ways that it, it's passed. And there's the scene where they're on the baseball field where Horace, the, the character who is developmentally delayed, I will call him, yep. is comes up to the comes up to the kids playing the baseball. And historically, all they had to do was sort of shake his hand. He would go on his way and continue on his walk. But right. this particular day, Horace is covered in feces. He smells awful. And one of the older boys who is, you know, generally even keeled and calm and nice starts freaking out and screaming um, that he's, you know, he's covered in shit and he's going to spread polio. He's spreading polio. Horace is the cause. And my initial thought, and I'd like to get your thought, is is this a Gettier case? Is that what? I'm sorry. Is it a Gettier case? Ah, oh, okay. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, I know I didn't, I didn't think about it that that way. Um, although probably we should explain what a Gettier case is. So you want to, you know, I'm you, not sure if everybody's in the Go audience. Um, so, so the, the Gettier issues uh, cases come out of uh, this uh, interesting paper published, I believe, in the 1960s. Uh, that, All of two uh, pages. Yeah, a very short paper, two pages, that uh, is one of the most famous papers in modern philosophy, because for the first time after more than two millennia, it, it questions the uh, standardly accepted definition of uh, knowledge as um, uh, justify true belief. That that definition more or less allegedly comes from Plato. There are actually a couple of places where Plato seems to say something like this. But let's take that, let's let's assume that Plato does have that definition of knowledge. So justified true belief, right? So the notion being that for, for me to claim that I know something, uh, those three components have to be in place. The easy one probably is belief. It would be really weird to say that I think I know something that I actually don't believe, right? That seems like to seems to imply some kind of logical contradiction. But the other two are, are a little more difficult to to get past, right? Because true, oh well, uh, it has to be true. That belief has to be true, otherwise it doesn't count for as as knowledge. Well, but the problem is that uh, our understanding of the truth changes all the time. So it's like you know, even scientific truth changes all the time. And justified, justified is the interest, to me, it's an interesting component, actually, most interesting component, because uh, it means, for instance, that when I say that I think that quantum mechanical theory is correct, uh, I'm not giving a piece of knowledge. I'm just repeating what somebody else told me, because I cannot justify that belief. I believe it. I sincerely believe that quantum mechanical theory is, is a fundamentally good uh, scientific theory. Um, there is good reason to think that it is near true, uh, you know, in the neighborhood of truth, as far as we can tell. Uh, but justified? Hell no. I cannot justify to you why uh, quantum mechanical theory is true. You have to ask a physicist, right? So if I'm simply repeating uh, uh, stuff that I heard from people that I trust, that's, that's, that's it. So, which means that I cannot claim knowledge of that. And if you apply Plato's uh, conception of knowledge, turns out we actually know a lot less than we think. Um, you know, most people probably don't even know that the earth goes around the sun. Because unless they can justify their belief, I mean, unless they can tell you why they think that that is the case, and a justification cannot be, I just read it in a book, um, then they probably don't know. They're just repeating something that they think is true, but it actually doesn't count as knowledge. Now, all of this to bring up the thing that, you know, Goethe came up with a couple of um, classes of exceptions to Plato's definition of knowledge. So imagine, for instance, that I'm walking down Central Park 
and uh, and I see uh, Jamie on the other side of uh, the path, and I say, "Hey, Jamie!" Right? And it turns out it's not Jamie; it's Jamie's twin sister, twin evil sister. Let's just to, let's add a, a little twist. Now, did I have knowledge? Do I have knowledge that that Jamie, when I when I was convinced that Jamie was there, did I have knowledge of the thing? Well, um, oh. Sorry, there's another bit. Jamie is in Central Park as it happens, right? It's just that she's not the one that I'm, I saw. She was around the corner. So when I say, hey, today I saw Jamie at Central Park, it is I knew true. Jamie was in Central Park. Right, th thank you. That I knew that Jamie was in, t in Central Park. Then that is true because Jamie, as it turns out, was in fact in Central Park, although it wasn't the Jamie that I thought, um, you know. <laughs> uh, and I believe it for sure because I, I've been, I, I was fooled by, by her. Uh, twin sister appearance and my belief was justified because for all I know I knew yeah I didn't know about a twin sister uh, up you know up until later on when, when she said hey you know I, that must have been my twin sister so I didn't know that my belief was just my eyes were telling me this is Jamie and I know Jamie pretty well I can tell Jamie from a you know random passerby so I have justified true belief did I have knowledge and of course the get the point is no, you don't, because as it turns out, that wasn't Jamie. Uh, you know, Jamie was around the corner. So, okay. Now, all of this, and and um, back to the novel. So, what is uh, what's the, what's the connection there? So, Horace is covered in poop, which right. we know was the vector of polio, right? And is um, we know he shakes Bucky's hand, right, right before Bucky quits his job and heads off to Indian Hill, yeah. and Kenny is yelling that he knows Horace is the one spreading polio. And it's right. very plausible that Horace was in fact yeah. how Bucky got polio and was able to bring it up to Indian Hill and spread yeah. it. But he can't really know that because at the time they didn't even know what the vector of That's polio right. was, but yet he's right. So this is I it thought is it was a case. Get your it case. Is a case. Yeah, it is. Absolutely. You're right. Uh, to, to my my uh, take uh, take home point on 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 Gettier cases in general, and actually this is a this really is a particularly good example, is that there is no such thing as knowledge. There is only more or less justified beliefs. Right. Uh, we cannot let's leave we can everybody never, with that. Yeah, let's leave it there. We so can terrifying. never have knowledge, uh, precisely because of situations like this. There is oh, in other words, the point, the basic point is. You may have very high degree of justification for something that it turns out to be literally true, and yet you may be missing an important bit of what's going on, such that if you had that, that understanding or that bit of information, your opinion would be, in fact, different. Your judgment would be, in fact, different. And so I would say that, that to me, indicates that with all due respect to Plato, there is no such a thing as human knowledge. And uh, all we have is justified beliefs. And in fact, I would drop even the part true, because we don't know whether, you know, we don't have, a, without, since we're missing, we, we don't have a God's eye view of things. We actually never know whether a belief is true or not. Uh, one of the things, I mean, this is getting pretty far from the novel, but you brought it up. So, uh, and it, I think it is an interesting point. Um, sometimes philosophers of science uh, try to get around the problem of truth, you know, truth itself being inaccessible. Uh, it would say, well, it's Truth like is in the neighborhood of truth. It's like, well, how do you know? <laughs> you, you only, you, unless you actually know where the truth is, you can't know whether your notion is in the neighborhood of truth or not. You can simply say, I have a justification for this belief. I have, you know, either a logic based based or an empirically based justification or both for this belief. And that's what I'm sticking with until I know better, until the logic changes or the, you know, the evidence changes and that, that's it. So in that sense, I think David Hume was right where he said that a, a you know, reasonable person always tries to proportion her beliefs to the evidence. And that statement has later been reinterpreted in Bayesian terms uh, as in, you know, you should always attach a probability between zero and one to all your beliefs, never zero, however, and never one. Because if you have zero belief in something, you're absolutely certain that it is not the case, or 100% belief in something, you're absolutely certain that it, that is the case, then new information, according to bias theorem, is unable to move your, your belief. 
And so you're stuck there. Even if there is new information coming in, you're stuck at the extreme. So you should always be somewhere in between. Point one, point zero, 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 one for things that you really don't believe. 99.9999 for things that you really strongly believe and more, more likely somewhere in between. Uh, but it's always a matter of justified justification and evidence, never of truth or knowledge. So on that, <laughs> I think we can probably leave it, right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so uh, thanks, Jamie, for bringing up that, that point. That was, I did not expect, I did not see that coming. I did not expect to end on that, that note. But hey, um, that's what you get with a live show where especially the two uh, hosts don't actually talk to each other very much about the book be uh, beforehand. So <laughs> there you go. Okay. Yeah, we've been talking. <laughs> <laughs> so let me just remind people that uh, we're going to come back in a little bit more than a month uh, on Sunday, May 16th at 1 p.m. Eastern time. We will be discussing the ethics of ambiguity with uh, by Simone de Beauvoir. That, that would be difficult to discuss it with her, but we will discuss it with uh, our friend Sky Cleary, uh, who will be joining us for, for that show. And so if you want to come to that one, just go to meetup.com and look for the Philosophy Book Club. That said, everybody stay safe. Bye-bye, Jamie. Bye.